anyway, this story takes place in late October, October of 1998. It's called An Ode to Jimmy the Greek. As is my custom, after I read the Trisayon, that's a memorial prayer at my parents' grave, I then go to the older Greek section of the cemetery at Cypress Hills to first pray over my childhood companion, Nick Gardellis. He was killed in action in Vietnam in 1970. We were over there at the same time, but in different army units. Nick had written me a letter stoically predicting his own death. My mother waited until I was safely home to confirm that he did indeed make the sac supreme sacrifice and that my grandmother, her mother, Yaya Lenny, had also passed away. My last visit is to the gravesite of my grandparents. On this windy late October day, it was the name day of Saint Demetrius, which is James or Jim in English. My grandfather's tombstone is engraved James Alexander. But in the Brooklyn neighborhood of my childhood, he was known solely as Jimmy the Greek. He died in January of 55 when I was barely six years old. However, my remembrance of him is so vivid, he could have departed yesterday. He didn't live to see his beloved Brooklyn Dodgers finally win a World Series from the mighty New York Yankees in the autumn of his passing. There was not a more passionate fan of the Brooklyn Bums, as they were affectionately called, than my Papu. One time, he was able to hold on to money long enough to outfit his four oldest grandchildren in Brooklyn Dodger uniforms. We would accompany him to one of the bars that he frequented and be introduced as his gang. I got my gang here. Anybody want to have a fight? I can still see his buddies look up and laugh. Ah, go on, Jimmy. He would have a quick one before taking us to the park. Yes, Jimmy the Greek loved his Kosciuszko. That's what he called the bottle of booze that he tried to hide from his wife in the small railroad flat where we all lived. Whenever Yaya Lenny could find a bottle, she would empty out some of it and then fill it back with vinegar or salt. <laughs> When Papu, in the middle of the night, sneaked a nip of the adulterated alcohol, he would spit it out as well as spinning, spitting out a string of Greek curses that he learned as a young seaman in Greece. Another time, Yaya, who didn't like to waste the electricity, had fallen asleep in the only bathroom we had. Papu, coming home late that night, went into the darkened bathroom to have a nightcap. From this new and yet undiscovered hiding place in the clothes hamper, he retrieved his prized nectar. At the sound of the bottle being uncorked, Yaya awoke and screamed. Papu dropped the bottle, which broke on the tile floor. He cursed the blue streak, waking even the neighbors upstairs. The devil must have put you there. I never felt the threat of Papu hitting Yaya. She was built like a Sherman tank. <laughs> in many ways, those days were innocent times. Most of the houses and apartments on our block could be opened with the same skeleton key that everyone had. Neighbors that we knew were, were honest, but sometimes a little naive. There was kind-hearted Rosie, who would come over to tell fortunes with cards. What puzzled me then? was that for all the times that she read the cards, she always somehow foresaw a good destiny. Whenever she seemed on the verge of, of seeing a bad occurrence, she would just curl her tongue, quickly reshuffle the cards, and make it turn out okay. Her fur coat carried the heavy smell of mothballs. She would endlessly talk about her grown children who lived in the same house with her. Ferdinand, Camilla, Mary, and even her canary, pretty boy. My older brother John would entertain her by mimicking the bird's whistle. One time, Papu was walking by Rosie's house while she was sitting on the front porch. What's wrong, Jimmy? she asked, seeing that, that he had his hand to his cheek and was moaning out loud, Oh, I have a terrible, 
toothache. Now in those days, a home remedy for tooth pain was a shot of whiskey. Swallowed after first letting the strong drink numb the infected area. So kind-hearted Rosie invited Pop Pooh into her home for the cure. A few days later, Rosie bumped into my mother at the AMP. How's your father? How's your father? What do you mean, Rosie? My mother was puzzled. Oh, he had such a terrible toothache, he drank half the bottle of Four Roses. <laughs> my mother told us that all she could do to keep a straight face and, and thank Rosie. Oh, thank you for being so kind. She just didn't have the heart to explain to her that Papu hadn't had a real tooth in his mouth in the last 10 years. <laughs> There were so many of us living in that small apartment that my mother was constantly rearranging furniture in an attempt to accommodate the grown children, her parents, and her husband. One night, she decided to switch the furniture in the living room with that of the girl's bedroom. The problem was the doorways were narrow and the kitchen was in the middle of the apartment. When my father and brother John tried to lift the couch past the kitchen, it got wedged overhead by the refrigerator with the legs extending sideways. I recall running back and forth underneath that couch in amazement. <laughs> no matter what they tried to do, they couldn't get it free. Papu went to Al's candy store, which was across the street on the corner. Uh, we got a couch stuck on the ceiling. Oh, Jimmy, you had a little too much to drink? Two of his friends offered to walk him home. It then became five men trying to get the couch unstuck. <laughs> well, after a futile half hour's work, they finally listened to my mother's suggestions and were able to turn it free in an instant. Yes, Jimmy the Greek had a weakness for drink, and he certainly wasn't an Ivy Leaguer. But his 56 years of life was anything but tea and crumpets. He was an orphan from the Laconian village of Kremasti, People on the island of Idra, who let him keep his family name of Alexandrakos, adopted him. He frequently sailed back and forth to Africa before coming, finally coming to America. He had a hot dog stand outside Kings County Hospital. That spot cost him $2 a day for the cop on the beat, whether or not he made that much money that day. When his horse became lame and was put away, he pulled the cart himself sometimes to the accompaniment of taunts from passing automobile drivers until he could afford another horse. Papu had Peter Lorre's large watery eyes, the roughest unshaven face, and the kindest, sweetest feelings for his grandchildren. His Sunday morning pancakes were so heavy that we called them pound cakes, <laughs> but they were heavenly delicious. When he cooked fish, he ate the head, calling it brain food. <laughs> Every so often, when he had a few dollars, small tins of feta cheese in their own milk gotten off ship, uh, ships from Greece would appear in the refrigerator. Papu would stock the family up with olive oil and kalamata olives. He enjoyed the simple pleasure of listening to the Prodomides radio show for the music and news from the mother country. One special Christmas, he gave me my first bicycle. I don't hear them call anyone Nick the Greek or Jimmy the Greek much anymore. I guess it's progress of a sort. And maybe ethnic tags belong in the past. But it is also my legacy, and I don't shrink from it. I remember those days when we had less. But we also seem to have had so much more. So, Jimmy the Greek, on your name day, I pray for your soul. I whisper that the 1998 Yankees won the World Series in four straight games this year, but heart for heart, they couldn't match the 55 Brooklyn Bums. My Papu, I can only hope that you and Yaya now, buried together for eternity, are finally getting along. <laughs> As I head down the gentle hill to the car, I see a flock of geese flying in formation against the darkening sky. Squirrels are, squirrels are scampering up and down the trees. The leaves are changing 
the bright fall colors. I don't feel the chill in the air, only the sweet warmth of remembrance. Thank you.